Zero Max Highlights. And here's your host, Carlos McConney. Greetings, friends. It's a pleasure to join you. Welcome to this edition of Euro Max Highlights. We begin the show with a quick glance at some of today's topics. Robotic, an exhibition featuring the history of humanoid robots. Gigantic, a designer who makes huge models of insects. Pragmatic, a handmade house that blends into its surroundings. Very sophisticated robotics technology exists today, and it continues to advance exponentially. If you're a science fiction fan, you can even say that we are pretty much living in the future. But even though the humanoid robots are already here, it is very interesting to look back at how this technology developed. An exhibition at the London Science Museum allows people to revisit the relationship between man and robot. I'm a machine. Is there anybody there? They can talk, Hello. communicate with people, and imitate their facial expressions. Some robots even look human. At the Science Museum in London, visitors can get up close and personal with humanoids. And it can be an emotional experience. Coming face to face with a mechanical human has always been a little scary. Over the centuries, each generation experienced this afresh as new waves of technology heralded new robotic forms. That sense of unease, of something you cannot quite put your finger on, goes to the heart of our or should I say your, long relationship with robots. Robothesbian is one of the exhibition's star attractions. This life-size humanoid robot was designed to communicate and entertain. The Science Museum is devoting an entire exhibition to this form of artificial intelligence. Simply called Robots, the show comprises more than 100 humanoid bots. With humanoid robots, there's this um, desire, I think, first of all, to build them for entertainment. Um, I think we've always just been entertained by this idea of creating mechanical people. Um, it's, it, humanoid robots is also a way of demonstrating our technological advancements. So the human body is amazingly complex, so trying to recreate it through technology available to us has always been a challenge for people. The exhibition Robots boasts the largest collection of humanoid robots ever assembled and even includes a few of the first models dating from the late Middle Ages, like this 16th century mechanised monk. Their movements were based largely on clockwork, um, so they were repetitive and predictable. They couldn't react with the, you know, the real world as, as we do, um, but it's the basis on which a lot of modern day robots um, were founded. Today's robots also showcase technological capabilities. This Kodomoroid communication android is highly realistic. She's never been seen outside Japan before. These days, robots are employed in many areas of our lives, in industry and research, as toys, even as performers. What looks so easy took years of work by robotic engineers to achieve, if it works at all. There are so many moving parts, so there are 12,000 parts in this robot, and we have to make every one of them. And if one of them is wrong, nothing works. So it's extremely complicated. The relationship between man and machine has interested artists for centuries. Science fiction films reflect the human longings and desires of their time. Whether fascinating or terrifying, researchers must also consider the potential social impact when deciding what the robots of the future should do. To think about you know, the benefits that this technology might bring to our society, but also the consequences, and to imagine you know, what sort of future do we want with robots, because I think it is a big question for our society to have to think about, not just humanoid robots, but all robotic technologies. However intelligent, robots are still machines. They remain an expression of our hopes, fears and dreams, even if the boundaries between humans and humanoids are increasingly blurred.
Let's move on to a loud outdoor activity that will probably grab your attention and might make you laugh with embarrassment. Stag calling. I never really considered it a hobby, but some hunters have even become champion stag callers. My colleague, Micah Kruger, decided to test her skills of this unusual ancient tradition. Let's find out if she was able to master it. Who is Germany's best stag caller? The jury and an audience of experts are concentrating. I'm the only layperson here. Women usually only sit in the audience. They seldom take part in the contest. Fair enough. These competitive calls are for stacks, not those. But I tried it out anyway. My coach is Imo Ortlep. He is a hunter and three-time German stack calling champion. I visited him in his forest school near Hanover before the championship. We don't waste time with small talk. The windpipe is much shorter in humans than in stacks, so we lengthen ours artificially, with pipes or even shells. I've made my choice. There are no words for how I feel. <laughs> okay, so? Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, der war gut. Great, that was the stag on the make. Hey girls, where are you? I said that? <laughs> We're off to a good start. My next lesson, practice with a keen listener. The hunter took in an abandoned fawn last spring and named it Harry. Actually, Harry shouldn't care much about our calls. Stags are quiet for 11 months of the year. They only roar out their challenges to each other in the mating season. Their calls can be heard miles away. Is stag calling actually a rather misleading term? Yes, I can communicate with the stag, but I can't call him to me. If he's with his herd, his ladies, then he has no reason at all to lead them just because another stag is calling. That's why I try to make him think I'm another stag approaching, and why I imitate the stepping sound of hooves. Harry sees us anyway, so we can't sneak up on him. We call out with everything we got. But Harry is not impressed. <laughs> From the gut. Emo Ortlep can imitate a wide range of the animal's moods. This is a stag in search of a mate. <laughs> Here are two stacks challenging each other to a fight. And this is the victory call. We take a break from training and go for a walk with Harry. As an adopted child, Harry doesn't have to risk an unpleasant encounter with a hunter, like deer in the wild. But there's one thing I really want to know now. When you call the stacks, does that mean they will always be shot? No, it's a big mistake to think that all stags that are called are also shot. We call stags to observe them, to count them, and only in the rarest cases to shoot them. My last lesson. Slowly, Harry and I understand each other better. But now my voice is failing me. Being able to overcome the urge to cough seems to be crucial in the fine art of stack calling. <coughs> After an hour of training, I feel like the singer in a death metal band. Back to the championships. Despite my lessons and practice, I don't qualify to compete. But Imo Ortlep has good chances, and now the heat is on. He's banking on a certain drama in his performance. 
The jurors' faces don't show what they think of his calls. There's still quite a bit of time before the winner is chosen. So in the meantime, I ask the jury for its judgment of me, outside of the competition. <laughs> so what do you think? What grade would you give me? Let's say a three out of six. <laughs> that's generous. <laughs> so I'm average. How thrilling. But Imo Ortlep, my coach, experiences a disappointment. He's only made sixth place. But he's a good loser. The others celebrate. Making the right noises is half the battle. In Italy, a historian and art lover has spent years collecting and researching hundreds of vinyl record covers. Why? Because of the cultural value of the art on those covers. Francesco Spampinato has grouped them together in this book that combines history, culture, music and art. Records may be old school, but these album covers will never be out of date. They're collector's items designed by A-list artists. One of the best known, this record sleeve for the Velvet Underground by Andy Warhol. This is probably the best known uh, um, record cover by a visual artist. Uh, and it was one of the first uh, record covers uh, that didn't feature, uh, um, as it was used to, um, singers uh, or band's members, uh, like photographic portraits of them or illustrations of them. He chose an everyday object, uh, like a banana. Francesco Spampinato is an art historian, record collector and author of a new book, Art Record Covers. It's an anthology presenting 500 covers and albums by visual artists from the 1950s through to today. It spans many different musical genres and schools of art. The earliest album dates from 1955, Jackie Gleason's Lonesome Echo with a specially commissioned cover by Salvador Dali. That was not just simply a record cover, it was an artwork in its own right. He did so by putting his own signature over it, very well visible and also by publishing on the back cover a photo of him and Gleason shaking hands and uh, also a, a short uh, interpretation of, uh, um, of, the, of the artwork he provided. Andy Warhol signed his Velvet Underground album from 1967. Originals sell for up to 150,000 euros. The Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, appeared the same year. The photo collage was by Jan Hayworth and Peter Blake, and it won a Best Album Cover Grammy. In the 60s, art and music were as thick as thieves. For the singers or bands who commission an artist to do the cover, I think is that uh, uh, they identify with that artist production. They want to give uh, probably uh, a deeper meaning uh, to the music they make, uh, and uh, which is something that maybe designers or illustrators uh, sometimes cannot offer them. They want something more. Portraits, for example. Rock and proto-punk diva Patti Smith liked to work with her close friend, the photographer Robert Mablethorpe. Some bands used works of art that already existed. Sonic Youth chose Gerhard Richter's Candle, painted five years before Daydream Nation came out in 1988. Others helped themselves to works without asking the artist, as with some of the 40 covers featuring images by street artist Banksy. And there are artists for whom album covers were a really important genre. Keith Haring did hundreds. Out of 3,000 candidate covers, he chose 500 for the book. Francesco is confident that real physical records and their beautiful covers will endure, even in the age of streaming. I think uh, that uh, the book and the, the record, the vinyl record, uh, are good uh, antidotes against uh, uh, this uncanny feeling of alienation that is produced by the internet and digital technologies nowadays. So in this sense, I think that the record cover as an art form will definitely survive. The record sleeve. 
quite possibly one of the 20th century's greatest canvases of art. We continue the show with insects. They are the most diverse group of animals on Earth, and we are about to take a closer look at these fascinating creatures. Today we visit a German designer who creates scientifically accurate, giant-sized insect models at scales reaching 100 times their actual size. Her work can be found in natural history museums around Europe and in private collections. She wants to help us see bugs in a new light. Insects, spiders, and other creepy crawlies. A hundred times larger than in real life. For some, a nightmare. But not for the creator of these replicas, Julia Sturz. She lives in Hamburg and started out as a costume designer. But more than 15 years ago, she turned her professional gaze from the stars on the stage to the teeming world below. I've always been interested in insects. I grew up in the country and played outdoors all the time. The tiny creatures fascinated me. I love to sit in front of anthills and observe the goings-on, all the sex and crime. It was gripping. That's how it developed. Julia Sturz has found a niche market providing museums with replicas of insects, a rarity till she burst onto the scene. She uses real physical critters as models as well as photos, often provided by the Zoological Institute of Hamburg University. Her replicas are true to life, accurate in their details. Currently, she's working on an Asian bush mosquito. Every animal has its distinctive attributes. They absolutely have to be there in any replica. For example, the number of bristles on a certain part of the body. In the case of the Asian bush mosquito, it's the white stripes on the legs and abdomen. I can't make anything up in terms of form or color. I have to stick to the facts. Museums all over Europe are lining up for her replicas. And recently, Sturz received an order from Canada. Eight of her masterpieces are now on show at the Natural History Museum in Bielefeld. It's an opportunity for people to get to know insects in a new way. Everybody knows elephants, and they're great for PR too. But a common housefly? I don't think so. But when you see insects close up and really big and in totally accurate replicas, as if you're looking through a microscope, then you see just how fantastic they are. And we could not survive without insects. Entire ecosystems would soon collapse without them. It takes us between three and six months to make one replica. The Asian bush mosquito is for a museum in Münster. First, she fashions models of the various body parts and makes molds around them, with which to make the components of the final product. I make the molds out of silicon. Then I pour in plastic to make the parts. When they harden, they look like this. That's the mosquito's abdomen. It's the basis for all the further stages. Then comes all the careful, detailed work. Sturz has to find the right bristles or hair. I use a lot of elk hair. Elks have many different kinds of hair, from very fine to very bristly. So they're suitable for many different species. Reindeer is good too. I've also used goat and dog hair. <laughs> Each piece, no matter how tiny, has to be glued in place by hand. Sturz charges between 8 and 25,000 euros for her replicas. She wants people to appreciate that insects are not just pests, but actually important and lovely. 
da ich mich mit Insekten beschäftigt habe. Since I started paying so much attention to insects, I've learned how incredibly varied they are and how skilled they are at surviving. They're so clever and they can do so much, it's amazing. Plus, they're totally beautiful. Even mosquitoes. Thanks to Julia Sturz's tireless efforts and artistry, we can now meet her beloved creepy crawlies face to face. It's time for some architecture and interior design near the capital of Sweden. We paid a visit to a man who designed the home he lives in with his family, and he also built it with a little help, of course. Now, the end result is pretty impressive, and he actually seems quite humble about it, as if everyone just builds their own houses all the time. So let's head over to the municipality of Solenturna in Stockholm, where we will visit his home. Welcome to Villa Altona. Please come in. This is the home of Alan Spiegel, his wife and their two children in Zollenturner, a suburb north of Stockholm. It stands on a rocky hillside shaped by the last ice age. Alan did not first clear and flatten the site as many do here. It's more natural to adapt a house to the nature than to adapt to nature to a new built house. Uh, so if we had to take everything away with a dynamite, we have to refill it and then we have to try to make a new nature. And uh, first of all, it's expensive and it's also quite ugly. Spiegel is a furniture designer and interiors consultant. He designed the house with his architect friends. Its form comprises cubes and oblongs, stacked like shipping containers. I'm interested in to try to build new things. For instance, in my daily work, we, we produce uh, furniture. And we always try to make some detail better or uh, something thinner or stronger. And uh, if you build a normal wooden house in Sweden, um, I can do it blind. It's easy for, for, for the most people if you just know how to use a, a hammer and a saw. Spiegel built the house with his bare hands and some help. The ground floor is open plan, designed to be a welcoming space where family and friends can come together. Such gatherings often centre on eating together, so the long stainless steel kitchen counter is at the heart of it all. In Sweden, it's cold, like six months per year. Uh, so the house is, is uh, it's, it's a place where you meet your friends. And if you compare it to, like, to Spain, you, you, you go out and you eat dinners with, you, with your friends, but you don't do that in Sweden. Of course, you go to restaurants, but you don't go to restaurants three, four days per week. So in Sweden, it's very, um, uh, I think it's very important to have a house where you can meet your invites, your friends. Upstairs are the bedrooms and bathrooms. I would not have the sliding doors if I may make this project one more time. Because you can hear lots of sounds, so it's, it's too little privacy for, uh, for the children and even for us. Um, and it works when the children are small, but it doesn't work when the children are growing up and getting, when they are becoming adults, they need the privacy. Alan Spiegel lost 10 kilograms with the exercise he got carrying all the materials and building the house. It was a new experience, not everything went quite according to plan. I'm colorblind, and uh, I always had one guy with me. We were, we were always two when we were building, because you always need to be two. And the house have four colors. I don't really know. It's like four brown, different uh, colors. And we were painting a whole day, and we were finished with this wall. In the afternoon, my wife came, and she said, it's, wrong, it's the wrong color. And I was angry with my friend uh, because I said, I'm, I'm colorblind. And then he said, yeah, but I'm colorblind too. 
That clearly didn't prevent them from finishing the colourful villa Altona. And that's it for today's highlights. Don't forget to join our official accounts on social media and to visit our webpage for more European culture news. Thank you for tuning into our show. We will be back with new episodes, so hopefully you'll join us again. See you soon, everyone. Take care.